Well, praise the Lord. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Do we have Facebook? Do we have Facebook? Let me check. It looks like we might have Facebook. Ooh, that light is bright. Um, I apologize. This is our first uh, setup we've done outside of uh, our little studio in the church for quite some time. And I see that light is quite bright. Let me see if I can reduce it somewhat. Um, that ought to help. Oh, yeah, that's, that's uh, better at least on Periscope. Well, it's still pretty bright uh, on Facebook. Um, once again, I'm doing this without help tonight, so I apologize. It takes a couple minutes to kind of figure things out once we get started. Uh, looks like we're live on Periscope and Twitter, and the color of the lighting is much better there. I'm, I'm not sure what it is that's causing so much light on Facebook. But um, anyway, <laughs> I'm going to put this live over on, uh, hey Torsha, good to have you with us, missed you Sunday, praise God. Um, I'm going to put this over on our church page as well, and so give me a moment to get that. I hate wasting time, but at the same time I know some people watch on, um, on the church uh, Facebook page, so I want to make sure that I've got it going over there, and it'll just take me a minute. I, I sometimes ramble while I'm do, <laughs> doing stuff like this. Uh, that looks good. Okay, let's see if we've got live on Facebook. I just got a notification, so it must be working, and let's see. There it is. Okay, now I go back to my Facebook page, which is the one I monitor, and um, and there I am, and there we go. All right, praise God. Um, we are live once again. We took a couple of weeks off. We took a little bit of vacation time and uh, went up north and visited family. And uh, we were, we were uh, indisposed at the time when I would have been doing the broadcast, uh, doing other things with our grandkids. But uh, we're back. And uh, so we're here and we're ready to go. Uh, our foundational scripture, most of you that have been watching uh, will know this by heart, but it's Joshua 1 8 from the Amplified Translation. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all that's written in it. Then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have or deal wisely and have good success so i wanted to just put that out there if you got nothing else tonight but that you, you got something really good amen uh boy i don't like looking at at the facebook uh feed it's um it's just really bright <laughs> and, and i don't know why um anyway and i see lights in the background reflecting off the glass so we'll figure this out uh it'll be better next week Anyway, I want to minister tonight on Paul's words on faith or about faith. But before I do that, I want to touch on something that's happening right now. Uh, a lot of people are talking and concerned about the, the coronavirus. Let me read something to you. In 1999, the big crisis was the Y2K, year 2000. <clears throat> if you remember that, everybody thought the world was coming to an end. Uh, in 2001, it was anthrax, it was going to kill everybody. 2002, the West Nile virus. 2003, SARS. 2005, the bird flu. 2006, E. coli. Uh, 2008, uh, the economy was going to destroy everybody. 2009, swine flu was the big thing. 2010, British petroleum oil was the culprit, was going to destroy the world. Uh, 2011, Obamacare is going to destroy our health because of bad uh, health care, and we're all going to die. <laughs> uh, two th that was 2011. 2012 was all about the Mayan calendar and supposed prophecies uh, prophesying that it would be the end of the world, and of course that didn't happen. Uh, 2013, North Korea was going to bomb us and kill us all, and 
2014, it was the Ebola virus. 2015, uh, if you remember the news, Disney, measles, and of course, Iris was going to destroy everybody. 2016, the Zika virus. 2017, fake news uh, was the big thing, and of course, that's still going on. Uh, 2018, the migrant caravans were the big issue. They were a crisis. And uh, 2019, measles was uh, going to be another pandemic. And now we got 2020, uh, the coronavirus. Now, if you didn't hear uh, my message from Sunday morning, uh, you ought to go back and listen to that. Uh, you can find it. Um, slow internet, stop and connect your liable internet connection. That's what it's telling me. Uh, and it's been, internet's been working just fine. So you see the devil didn't want to hear any of this. Doesn't want you to hear it. Um, so Sunday, I, I shared a little bit. Pastor Mary is ministering a great message. And I shared a little bit uh, about how we stop the coronavirus. Number one, resist the devil, he will flee. Uh, number two, we need to take God at his word and believe his word is true and realize that uh, the coronavirus and everything else I mentioned was under the curse. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse. And I shared some scriptures out of Deuteronomy 28 and uh, a couple others. So go back and look at uh, or listen to our, my message from our, our service from Sunday morning. And uh, I shared these things just before I introduced Pastor Mary. So that might be worth you going back. The first thing we got to realize is that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. He also gave us a sound body. He also gave us redemption from the curse. Jesus bore our infirmities, our sicknesses, our diseases, our pains, our sorrows, our punishment for sin, even our poverty. He bore every aspect of the curse. Why? So we wouldn't have to bear it. He was our substitute sacrifice. And as we get into my teaching tonight, we'll talk more about that aspect. All right, so I wanted to share that with you. Uh, thank you all partners for uh, staying with us through the new year and, and uh, getting us going uh, here into 2020. We appreciate our partners, appreciate everyone that has found value in what we're doing and the teaching we're providing and has decided to be a partner with us. As you know, we're believing God for 100 partners through our social media platforms. And uh, if you're not a partner and we're blessing you and you'd like to be a partner, uh, just do it. <laughs> don't hesitate. Um, we don't ask anybody to do any specific amount or level, uh, whatever you feel impressed to do. And that will give us the ability to keep doing what we're doing, but also as that grows, it'll give us the ability to expand into more areas uh, through the social media and eventually, I believe, in uh, some broadcast on, on television. So believe with us for that. Uh, those of you that got notes, I think, Torsh, I think I sent a set of notes out to you tonight. Uh, I just do that periodically to people that have uh, partnered with us, that, and it really is meant for our partners. Uh, but sometimes I get, I get a text from somebody uh, that uh, something we said really blessed them and I'll feel impressed occasionally to send out some notes for, the, for them. So I sent out the notes, and I put on the notes a big note. When you see scripture, and I'm saying this for everybody's sake when you are studying my notes, <clears throat> when you see scripture in the notes that are italicized, that's, that's the scripture, the way it is given, it's quoted. But when you see bold, not italicized, words in parentheses, uh, these are inserted in a verse uh, to clarify the word or statement just before where they were inserted to give you a better understanding of that verse. And sometimes that really helps. I know that's why I like the Amplified Translation for that very reason. All right, so what apostle, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul had to say about faith? Well, Romans 1, 17 from the Amplified Translation he says, for in the gospel, God's word, a righteousness which God ascribes is revealed, both springing from faith and leading to faith, disclosed through the way of faith that arouses or produces 
more faith. As it is written, the man who through or by faith is just and upright shall live and shall live by faith. Now I want to just take that apart a little bit for you here uh, to hopefully give you a better understanding of it. He says that the revelation that God gives us uh, and the most important one, hey Carol Thornton, good to have you with us tonight. Hallelujah. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, the, the, the righteousness which God ascribes to us or gives to us and is revealed is the result of the word we heard that produced the faith to receive Jesus. We heard the word, we heard the word on salvation, we heard the word on deliverance, we heard the word on healing, we heard the word on prayer, answered prayer, our right standing with God, our boldness, our authority, our, our dominion. Whatever words you heard that produced faith in your heart and then as we meditated upon that, hey Karina, good to have you with us also, praise the Lord. As we meditated upon the word that God gave us, that came out of faith from the word we heard, what happens is that meditation on the word will produce more faith along that line or along that subject line. So it kind of sounds repetitive and, and, and uh, it could be sounding confusing, but all he's saying is that the righteousness God gives to us was revealed to us because we heard the word, we heard what Jesus did, and as we meditated upon that, it produced greater faith for the work that Jesus did for us. Now that makes sense, right? Okay, he says the man who through or by faith is just, in other words, those that have been born again by faith in Jesus shall live, that's the first part of that statement, we shall live, not die. Don't worry about the coronavirus, it, it, it's come and gone in the name of Jesus, just like all those other crises. It will disappear, and it won't be very long now. All of a sudden, it won't even be in the news, and you wonder, whatever happened? Well, the power of God got a hold because of our faith and believing God, and that thing could not take a foothold and go any further, and I declare it stopped now in Jesus' name. So he says, we shall live. And he says, and we shall live by faith. So as we walk in faith, it's going to produce the power of life that comes from the faith of God. And we will walk in that, that greater experience of life, free from the curse, free from the weaknesses and, and things that the devil wants us to believe we have to live with. Amen. Now, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 from the King James says, for we walk by faith and not by sight. And so again, how do we walk? We walk by faith, not by sight. We're not moved by what we see. We're not moved by what we feel. We're not moved by what we hear. The news. We're not moved by what they tell us. I don't listen to that news and, oh, I wonder what's happening with the coronavirus. I wonder how many have been infected, how many this and how many that. I'm not the least bit concerned about it. I told my granddaughter, oh, now it's been a few years ago, our oldest granddaughter, Autumn, uh, I think it was around 2012 when everybody was scared that because the Mayan calendar uh, ended its cycle in 2012, that somehow indicated the end of the world. And she asked me, she says, Papa, she says, is there any chance that that could be true, that, that that could be the end of the world? And I went back and told her some of the things I read to you from that list. That the, the devil wants to manufacture a crisis Every year, obviously, it's been as long as I've been alive, it seems like there's been a manufactured crisis uh, about every year. Uh, and it's more, more obvious now and it's more often now than it used to be. I said, don't worry about it. That's just the lies of the devil. Somebody came up with a, uh, a, a little definition of fear. And think about it, fear, false evidence appearing real, F-E-A-R. False evidence appearing real. The devil wants to throw false evidence at us because anything that doesn't line up with the Word of God is false. It's a lie. He's the father of liars. But God's the God of truth. And so when, when the thoughts come about, you know, we're fearful about something, whether it's 
the stuff that's going on now or whether it's something, uh, maybe you got a symptom in your body or maybe they're laying people off where you work, you're fearful of losing your job. Whenever fear hits you, it is not God. It is the devil. And he's trying to get you to, to basically take his medicine. He's trying to get you to believe the lie that you're going to lose. You're going to get defeated. You're going to be sick. You're not going to make it. So we have to resist that. And the Bible says resist the devil. That means everything he throws at us, every thought, every symptom, every evidence that we see with our eyes and feel and so forth. We have to resist that. And the Bible says when we resist the devil, he will flee. And those symptoms and those lies will flee from us. Amen? Amen. All right. So we walk by faith, not by sight, not by emotions, not by feelings, not by reason. We walk by faith in God's promises. Now, all the work that God has done for us or on behalf of us is revealed in the Word and received by faith. So... What does that mean to you now? Well, when you read the word on healing, that the Holy Spirit is going to give you a revelation that, hey, healing's available. There was a long time that we didn't know that healing was available. And uh, back in the 50s, we had a revival that brought forth not only healing, but miracles and so forth. And then in the 70s, we had a revival of teaching that brought truth to us. And that's when I got a hold of the truth and realized that God's a good God. He's on our side. He's not against us. God is not our problem. The devil's the problem. But he shouldn't be a problem to you if you're walking by faith. See, the, the Bible says he's under our feet. The only time you should ever hear anything from the devil is when you pick your foot up as you're stomping on his head. Amen. All right. So we receive revelation from the word, which gives us the ability to receive the promise of God in our lives. And we do that as we meditate on the Word of God. And as we meditate the Word of God, then the Holy Spirit comes to us and speaks to us about the things that Jesus has spoken and promised us. And that's where we I read to start off with Joshua 1.8. The book of the law, God's Word, shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate on it. That means order your conversation in, in agreement with the Word. Don't be talking... I was in the bank today, and I'm, I'm at, at my teller, and we're talking, and the woman comes up to the teller right next to me, and she says, oh, it's really warm outside today, and, and it's supposed to rain Sunday, and I, I wanted to interject and tell her we're believing, you know, but I uh, believe in God for rain, and she says, oh, you know, it's just uh, global warming. People have swallowed that lie. If you, do, if you look at the statistics and the NASA uh, studies and the scientific truth, not the false junk that's been spread around, we discovered that there hasn't been more than a half a, tenth, a half a percent variation in the temperature as far as the, 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 com or the, the average temperature uh, over the course of a hundred years, since before industrialization in the 1800s. We have normal cycles the earth goes through because of the various things that act on us, uh, the magnetic forces uh, going around the sun, the tilt of the earth, uh, where we are in our, in our um, you know, the, the, as we go around the sun and what angle the earth is and so forth. All these things, and then we've got the, the solar uh, flames or the solar waves that come from the sun, the ionization that affects the earth. All these are the things that impact our environment. It's not the the stuff where gases were put in the air is not how much pollution. Now, we shouldn't pollute, pollute our lakes and streams, but we're not talking about man-made uh, global warming. It doesn't exist. In fact, NASA has come out now and said that, that man has less than one-tenth of one percent impact on the global environment. And they say it is not man-made. This is natural things that we're going through, and don't get shook up about it. Don't listen to that garbage. We walk by faith, not by what the false news tells us. Amen. So we begin to, going back to Joshua 1, 8, as we meditate, we're speaking what the Word says, not what the news says, not what people say, not what we hear, not what we feel, not what we see. We speak what the Word says. That's called meditating the Word of God. And we do it on an ongoing basis. It becomes a way of life. 
that our words are always brought into alignment with the truth of God's word. Okay? Now, when we do that, he says that so that we do that so that you may observe. The, when you study that back in the original language, it's talking about gaining or getting insight or what we call revelation. So as we meditate the Word of God, the Holy Spirit speaks to us about what we've been declaring or confessing, and He gives us revelation and insight. Hallelujah. He says the next, the next step here, and do. Got to be a doer of the Word. Can't be a hearer only. You got to decide you're going to do what the Word says. And, and, you know, the Bible says we're blessed in our deeds. When we do what God says, we are blessed. It's only when we disobey and, and don't do what God says that the curse uh, is allowed to come on us. The door is open through our unbelief or our disobedience. Not God's problem. I mean, I'm saying he's not giving us the problem. All right. So, and do according to all that's written in it. He said, then you will make your way prosperous. Your actions of faith in the Word of God, meditating and doing the Word, is going to cause you to make your way prosperous. He says, and then you shall deal wisely in the affairs of life and have good success. So prosperity, dealing wisely, good success are the result of what you do with the Word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So, uh, and let me repeat what I said about meditating the Word of God. It's not a mystical thing. Meditating the Word of God is simply forming a confession of faith. It takes on 91. Even while they, they're talking about, uh, you know, this uh, coronavirus, go to your Bible, go to Psalm 91, and put it in the form of a confession over yourself. All right? I hide, I am hidden under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can withstand. That enemy trying to cause coronavirus cannot withstand the power of God and our safety in God. So you go back to that scripture or whatever scripture you're standing on for whatever the issue is you're dealing with, and you make a, a declaration or a confession. I know a lot of people don't like that word confession, but uh, we're, we're confessing the word of God or we're declaring the word of God over our situation. We're making a declaration of faith, and we ought to be doing that. Amen. I keep getting things up here that says, uh, uh, Facebook notification, but it doesn't tell me what it is. So I'm going to keep on going. I believe everything is working just fine. Amen. All right. Uh, if anybody's having trouble hearing, if the sound is poor, uh, give me a comment and let me know so that I can uh, know about that and try and work it out better next time. All right. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. I'm, I'm giving you things that Paul said about faith. When we get to John, John speaks about faith in a whole, totally different context. He talks about our faith in God, our faith in Jesus, our faith in redemption. And what Paul talks about is the product of using our faith. So we're going to see both and kind of compare them. But Paul, or John also has some great things to say, and I think we might get to that next week. All right. So then Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing. All right, thank you, Torsha. Everything is fine, good on this end on Facebook. Thank you. I don't look like I'm glowing white, huh? <laughs> on my phone, it looks like I'm glowing. That must be the glory of the Lord, hallelujah. So then faith cometh by hearing. What does faith do? First thing it says, so then faith cometh. Faith comes when we follow through the rest of that verse. Faith cometh by hearing. You've got to hear the gospel. You've got to hear the word before faith can come. He says, and hearing by the word, and the Greek word is rhema. You all know this. You've heard me preach it and teach it. The Greek word rhema means the spoken word. Now, right now, to a degree, as I'm teaching on the Word and you're hearing it, that's build, building a certain amount of faith in you. But it's not what you hear somebody else preach. The greatest faith will come when you begin to declare the Word over your situation. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the rhema, the spoken Word. As you speak it, it builds faith. 
And when it builds faith, faith is coming, isn't it? Faith is showing up. It's coming to you, and it's manifesting. Hallelujah. All right. The Young's literal translation says it this way. So then, faith is the report. Now, some of you may remember the old electric typewriters that when you, when you touched them, the key, it was a loud you know, sound when you touched it. And they called that a report. In fact, there's one typewriter called, uh, I forget the brand name, uh, but it was called The Reporter. And it wasn't because it was used by news people, because it was such a loud noise that it made when you touched the key, uh, that, and that was the electric ones. Uh, but it's a sound, right? Well, he says, so then faith is by, or comes by, a report, a sound, and what we're talking about, the sound we should be listening to, is the Word of God. Amen? So faith comes as the sound of God's Word comes to us and says, and the report, or the sound of God's Word, through, a, through saying the Word, the Word of God. Now that's Young's literal translation. That's pretty cool. He comes right out and says, the sounds that we should be hearing are what God has been saying. And the only way we're really going to get it is when we begin to sound out with our words what God has been declaring as promises to us. And not someday, but receive them now. Joshua and Caleb, when they came back with the other spies from the promised land, they, they gave a good report. What did they do? They said... In, in the way of a declaration of their faith, really, everything that God said. The land is, and they said this, the land is everything God said it was. It's a land that flows with milk and honey, and, and here's the fruit of it. And they're, they're giving a good report. They're giving a good sound, which was what God had declared. And the Bible declares that, that they, as you know the story, would later on enter into the promised land. But... The other ten spies, the Bible says, gave an evil report. And what was their report? What was the sound they were giving? The sound they were speaking was a sound of failure, the sound of defeat, the sound of I can't, we can't, it won't, it isn't. Uh, there's giants in the land. There's big walled cities. And we're like grasshoppers in their sight, and so, or in our sight, and so we were in theirs. They're, they're giving reports. They're get speaking out sounds of unbelief. And we got to quit speaking sounds of unbelief. Amen? All right. So this is, this is some of the things Paul has been saying. Now, Romans 1, 17, the uh, third part of that verse, uh, which we've already read and talked about a little bit. The man who through faith is just and upright shall live and shall live by faith. And I read to you, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, Romans chapter 4, got to double check here, so make sure I didn't have a typo. Uh, let's see, nope, that was right. Okay, Romans chapter 4, verse 13, from the King James translation. The promise <clears throat> that he should become the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law but through the righteousness of faith. Now he's going to explain that. Verse 17, as is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. This is what God was speaking to Abraham. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens or makes alive the dead, and calleth, reports, he gives a report, calleth those things which be not as though they were. He said that God himself spoke things or gave a report of things that didn't yet exist or were not yet manifested as though they were. God said, light be. What's light? <laughs> I mean, there was no light. Where did where, where was where'd that light come from? Because we know the sun, moon, and stars weren't created until I think it was on the fourth day. So what was that light? What was the light that came forth instantly the moment said, light be? It was his own glory that lighted creation. 
and it came forth into his work of creation. The glory of God lighted everything around. All right, so in verse 18, now we're talking about Abraham here and that he was like God. And, God, and, and just like God, it says he spoke of things that were not yet manifested as though they were. All right, verse 18, it says, who against hope believed in hope. Now the word hope there, yeah, and this is a good definition for you to write down, means confident expectations of good things to come. I don't expect bad things to come. I expect good things to come. That's my hope. That's my vision. That's my goal. I expect to be debt free. I expect to walk in divine health. I expect to have my new home or my new car or a better job or a bonus or a promotion or whatever it is you're believing in. I expect my family to be healed and protected and whatever it is that, that you're believing God for, we've got to develop a vision of that as that end result. In fact, the Bible says God speaks the end or the end result from the beginning. And if we're going to be like God, we've got to begin to speak the end result, even though we can't see it yet. We can't feel it yet. We haven't heard it yet. The bad reports are still there. But we speak the end result. I'm not moved by what I see, hear, feel, taste, touch, smell, right? My senses. I'm moved by what I believe, and I believe God's word. Hallelujah. All right. <laughs> I, I, yesterday, or last night, Pastor Mary and myself watched um, uh, the, the movie that's uh, about, um, um, oh, Fred, um, <laughs> all of a sudden his name escapes me. Uh, the one that had the kids program, they, they made a movie, Tom Hanks is playing the, the role. Um, anyway, uh, one of the things that uh, he said in, in uh, that, talking to uh, a guy who was doing an article on him, he said, I'm not, I'm not interested in the lights, the cameras, the big the publicity, the notoriety. He says, I'm interested in talking to the person on the other side of that lens there. I'm interested in talking to that child that's listening and they're on the other side of their TV screen listening to what I've got to say and I want to connect with them. I thought, man, that's a great description of the way I feel when we're doing this. I want to connect with you. I, I want it to be as if I'm talking to just you and nobody else. And that goes for everybody that's watching. That, that you're con I'm connecting with you and you're connecting with me through the Word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So he said, it says here that Abraham in verse 18, Hey, brother, Pastor Piaz, good to have you watching tonight. Howdy. <laughs> uh, verse 18 of Romans chapter 4, talking about Abraham, who against hope believed in hope. He believed in his vision. He believed in his goal. He believed in the promise of God, which was his goal. All right. Uh, that he might become the father of many nations, which is what God promised him. According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And listen to this. Being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, not dead because of his age. It was basically he couldn't reproduce children, uh, being about 100 years old. That's what it says here. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. She was in her 90s about 90 years old. And, and, you know, medical science will tell you when you're that old, you can't have kids anymore. Your wife can't produce a child. You can't produce a child. But Abraham didn't consider, he, he did not take into the equation the condition that he was currently in. The, the faith equation for him is, what did God say? That is my goal. That's where I'm headed. I'm not moved by what I see in my body or feel in my body or don't see or feel. I'm moved by what God says. So he hoped against hope. In other words, natural hope was gone. There was no natural hope that his body or her body could produce a child. But he hoped, he had a greater hope, and that was what God said. And he envisioned the end result, that he would have children by his wife, 
and that they would become as many as the sands of the sea or the stars in the heavens, that kings would come from them, that nations would come from them. And, and here they are, 90 and 100 years old, and together they had not had a child yet. Now, 14 years earlier, he had one with, with her handmaid, but that was not the promise of God. The promise was through Abraham and his wife, and then Isaac was the, the son of promise. All right, so uh, he considered not the deadness of his, uh, his own body or the deadness of Sarah's womb, being about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of her womb. He staggered not, verse 20, at the promise of God through unbelief. He didn't let his body tell him what was so. He didn't let Sarah's condition uh, decide for him whether or not this was going to come to pass. He didn't stagger in unbelief. When we get our focus on the condition, the problem, instead of the solution, which is God's promise, we can begin to stagger. We get weak. We get double-minded. But when you keep your focus on what God has promised, and you will not give up, you take hold like a bulldog. You will not quit. And when you do that, what happens is it, it, down the road at some point, that promise to you will, be, will manifest. Now, the more often you do this, the more consistent you are living this way, what's going to happen is the time frame from the amen to the there it is starts getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. you got to decide to live this lifestyle. This is not a get-rich-quick scheme. This is not a, you know, an overnight thing. This is something, it's a lifestyle we choose to live because it works. It's the way God created things, and, and he's given us the power to bring his creative force in, into action in our lives by declaring his promises over our situation. Amen? All right. Now, verse um, 21, being fully persuaded. What does that mean? He was persuaded. He was convinced. You couldn't have knocked it out of him with a two-by-four, if you understand that terminology. We've got to meditate the word, the promises of God, until they renew our mind to the point we're, we're brainwashed. <laughs> and literally, that's, that's a true statement, the, the washing of the water of the word of God. It, it washes the unbelief from our thinking and produces that, that seed of faith in our thinking and we continue to meditate upon it, and that seed takes root and grows and begins to be, become a truth to us until we walk it out and we see the manifestation of it. Amen? All right. Fully persuaded that what God had promised, he, God, was able and would, not just that God can, but that God will do it for me. Abraham was convinced God would do it for him. Not just that God was able to do it, but that God would do it. we got to get past God is able. When I was a kid and we used to go to summer camp, they sang a song, uh, God is able, God is able. I know he's able. He's, he's able, and I don't recall all the rest of the words, but I remember that. He's able. But we got to get past, I know God's able. I know God can do it if he wants. we got to get to the point, God will do it for me. It's all, in fact, it's already done. It's a matter of you receiving it by faith. Amen? All right. Now, let me ask you a question because this enters in at some point. <clears throat> what about other people's unbelief? What happens when people start, that they don't agree with you? Well, you can't do that. You can't have this. You can't. What, what do you do with that? Well, the Bible says that other people's unbelief will not make the word of God of none effect. So let's read that. In Romans chapter 3, Paul writing about faith, verse 3, Amplified Translation, What if some did not believe and were without faith? Do you know any people that they don't believe in healing? They don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit? They don't believe in prophecy? They don't believe in miracles for today? They don't believe that they can receive answer prayer every time they don't believe that god will give them a better job or give them a raise or a bonus or a promotion or provide finances through other sources that they hadn't even thought about we all know people like that i mean you you can't beat it into them they just choose choose not to believe like thomas i will not believe unless i can see it 
Well, bless God, we, we, we'll never see it if we don't learn how to trust God and take him at his word. Amen? So he says, what if some did not believe and were without faith? Does their lack of faith and their faithlessness nullify and make ineffective and void the full faithfulness of God and his fidelity to his word? Well, the answer obviously is no. Their unbelief cannot stop the, the word of God from producing and cannot stop a person that will take it by faith from receiving. So don't let them talk you out of it. Uh, when, when you've been prayed for and you go to the doctor and he, he gives you a bad report, it's not what you believe in God and, and people get around you and start telling you, well, you know, this is just the way it is and not anything you can do about it, you know. They, and they make this statement, fight the good fight of faith. What they mean is hang on and hang in there and someday, you know, maybe, don't know, never know what God's going to do. But the truth is that if you will not listen to their unbelief, they can say what they want. Man, I shut my ears. I'm not going to listen. Sometimes I have to walk away. Sometimes I have to get up and, and, and finally say, no, I don't receive that. If they're bombarding me with their unbelief, I don't receive that. That's not what I'm believing for. Well, you can't do this. You can't do that. I don't receive that. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. How come I can say that? Because that's a promise of God written to every believer, and I'm a believer. Hallelujah. All right. So verse 4, the, the answer to the question, will their unbelief stop the word of God from producing? The answer in verse 4 is by no means. All right. Let God be found true, though every human being uh, is false and a liar, as it is written, so that you may, so that you may, it's written, so that you may be justified and shown to be upright in what you say. Are you upright in what you say? Are you speaking truth? Or are you speaking the condition, the circumstance, the false evidence that's appear, appearing real to you is nothing more than lies? What are you speaking? He says, uh, let God be found true, and every, though every man being a uh, human being is false and a liar, as it is written, so that you may be justified and shown to be upright in what you say and prevail when you are judged by sinful men. Now, the prevailing there is not, in a sense, prevailing over people. It's prevailing over your circumstance, prevailing over your problem, whatever it is that you're dealing with, whatever that fight of faith is about, that you will prove to those unbelievers that God's word is true. And anybody can believe God's word and get results if you'll just choose to do the steps necessary to make that work in your life. Amen? All right. So I, I told you a minute ago, or a few minutes ago, man, time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Hallelujah. When the 12 spies spied out the promised land, and as you know, only two came back with a good report, 12 came back, um, with a an evil report. And the two that had the good report were Joshua and Caleb. And so uh, they, they were able or allowed to enter the promised land because they basically agreed with God. Their report agreed with what God has said. And the unbelief of the majority, see, there, there, was, there were the only two people that believed God. The majority, how many millions of Jews were there they, that now had multiplied and, and come as they, they came, they left Egypt and they were heading toward the promised land. How many were there? There's a lot of people. And only two believed God when it came time to take the promised land. Don't ever think because you're the minority and you're the only one speaking faith that the people around you are right and you're wrong. If you've got God's word to stand on, do not be moved by what they say. Don't be moved by all the false evidence they're giving you. Allow yourself only to be moved by what God's word has declared to you. That's my evidence. That's truth. That's what I stand on. Amen? All right. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18, and of course Paul wrote to the Hebrew Christians, chapter 3, verse 18 from the Amplified Translation, and to whom did God swear that they should not enter into his rest? But to those who disobeyed, who had not listened to his word, 
and who refused, now, now listen to this, they refused to be compliant or become persuaded. When, when Thomas was told that Jesus had been raised from the dead, he refused to believe the testimony of the eyewitnesses. He refused to believe the testimony of Jesus' own words and the words of the covenant that prophesied that this would happen. He refused to be persuaded. Some of the people around you refuse. I remember I, I talked to, um, uh, 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 this has happened more than once, but um, I, I remember a story, I'm, I'm thinking a number of different stories in my mind right now of experiences we've had. Uh, let me give you somebody else's experience. Uh, one, one of my associate pastors years ago was ministering to um, a um, woman in the hospital, and uh, I believe it was a woman. I, if it, well, either a woman or a man. There's only two. <laughs> anyway, the person he was believing or, or ministering to in the hospital, I believe it was the wife uh, of, of a couple, and, and uh, she had some form of cancer, and uh, he had ministered to her the word, and uh, she she was not receiving. She was resisting, and and uh, he was praying in the spirit, and the Holy Spirit revealed to her that she had unforgiveness. And uh, he said, what happened in your life? She, what do you mean? He says, the Lord just showed me you're holding on to unforgiveness. You, there's somebody that's done something to you that you are not forgiving them. And, and until you forgive and release them, the healing power can't flow into your body. And she got mad and angry and said, well, my husband, and she told the story about some things that her husband did. And, and she says, I will not forgive him. I don't care, I'll take it to my dying, my grave. I will not forgive. And my associate pastor said, well, there's nothing more I can do for you because uh, that, that unbelief that's like rottenness to the bones. That's cancer. And that's what she was dying of. And uh, he, he finally said, there's nothing more. Until you decide to forgive, I'll never forgive him. You know, Well, she did die of cancer. The healing could not manifest. We, we've got to learn to, uh, when we have people around us that don't believe like we do, and they criticize or they make fun of us, uh, they challenge us, they, they uh, say bad things about us. I've had my share of that over the years. You know what? Forgive them. Uh, like Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There's people today in politics that the left wing has gone so off the rails that they, they don't even know what they're doing. They've gone from bad to worse. And uh, we, have to, we don't have to receive what they're saying, but we still need to forgive them. God wants them saved. And you think, how can God want somebody, and you name the name in politics you're thinking about, because God for God so loved the world, and that's us. That's everybody. Before we, it says, while we were yet sinners, Paul said, God sent Jesus to pay the price. So we have to learn to forgive these people who don't agree with us in our faith. And when they call you a fool, I've been called a fool. I've been called an idiot. I've been called ignorant because I take a stand on the Word of God and I won't back down from it. And I'm like one of those bulldogs, man. I, I dig in and I dig my heels in and I'm not, I'm not going back. I'm believing God till, I'm believing God from now on. I'm not just till Jesus comes because you know what? When we go up in the rapture, we're going to believe God for, for eternity. Amen? And of course, then we'll have it right in front of us, the manifestation of it. All right. So it says here, that these people that were not allowed to enter into the promised land, which was all but Joshua and Caleb, and all those people, the majority was not right. Folks, I got to tell you, many, many times the majority is not right. We're in voting right now. And, uh, you know, we hope the majority votes conservative and votes, uh, you know, by the Spirit and, and biblical and and, and votes for people that are standing up for the things of God, not people that are taking the name of God out of everything and, and doing things totally against God. Well, there are some people out there refu that refuse to be persuaded by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Forgive them. The people that called you foolish, 
called you an idiot, uh, said that you didn't know what you're talking about, you're ignorant. Uh, and, and the truth is they were the ones that are ignorant because they don't know what the word says and they've chosen not to believe it or not to spend time in it to find out. Forgive them. Let them go. Amen? All right. So, verse 19. So we see that they, the unpersuaded ones, were not able to enter into his rest. See, the promised land was rest. As a Christian, we ought to already have entered into God's rest. We shouldn't be full of turmoil, fear, anxiety. We ought to be walking in his rest. Not just at night when you go to sleep, although that's, that's part of it. You ought to have a restful night's sleep, undisturbed, refreshing. But what about your daytime? What about your waking moments, your hours through the day? We ought to walk in God's rest 24-7. Amen? They could not enter into his rest because of their unwillingness to it excuse me, <laughs> to adhere to, trust in, and rely on God. And right here in the Amplified Bible, it says, unbelief had shut them out. Unbelief will shut you out of healing. It will shut you out of prosperity. It will shut you out of the wisdom of God. Unbelief will shut you out of the blessings and promises of God. We can't allow willful unbelief to shut us out. We've got to be willing to be persuaded by the Word of God. How do you do that? You get in the Word and you meditate upon it until it's renewed your mind and you become fully persuaded. Oh, good to have uh, old high school buddy, Min Maeda. So, sorry I mentioned your last name. I didn't mean to uh, give you away. <laughs> and uh, Morgan and Kia, good to have you with us tonight. we got a good crowd with us tonight. All right, uh, I've got just a few minutes left. Let me go to... Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We're talking about what Paul has to say about faith. Amplified translation. Verse 23. Since all have sinned and, and are falling short of the honor and glory which God bestows and receives, all are justified and made upright and in right standing with God freely and, and gratuitously by His grace. So he said, all have sinned. Everybody born into this world except Jesus, has sinned. But because sin came up on all men, Paul has, tells us in another place, righteousness has come upon all men. Now, that doesn't mean you're automatically righteous, but it's available to all men. That righteousness is out there and available to every single person. All right? So he says, all are justified by his grace, which is unmerited favor, something we didn't deserve, and his mercy through the redemption which is provided in Christ Jesus. In other words, we didn't deserve it. We couldn't earn it. You can't earn salvation. I've heard people say, you know, when we talk, I ask them, are, are you saved? Are you a Christian? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do good works and I give and, and I'm out helping the poor. And that's not what gets you to heaven. I mean, those are all good things. Jesus commended the Jews for their good works. But that's not what gets you to heaven. He said, you must be born again. Well, the most of you that are listening to this, I'm sure, are born again. If you're not, you need to go to Romans 10, 9, and 10 and do what it said. Believe in your heart. Make a choice to believe what God said, that, Christ, that God raised Jesus from the dead, and then confess him as your Lord, and you will be saved. Amen? Hallelujah. All right. So, talking about Jesus Christ, that God provided redemption through him. Verse 25 whom God put forward before the eyes of all as a mercy seat and propitiation, which simply means a substitute sacrifice. In the Old Covenant, there was a lamb slain once a year on behalf of every person, and because of that, their sins were covered for the year. But that's looking back on what happened, and now we, we perform a sacrifice, we sprinkle the blood, now our sins were covered for the last year, but with Jesus, we look forward because the work has already been done. We're not having to do it to cover the past. Our past is forgiven. When you get born again, your sins are forgiven, wiped out like they never existed. As far as the east is from the west, which means there's no way they can come back on you. Amen? All right. So the propitiation is the substitute sacrifice, the one in the Old Testament, which was a lamb that died for the sins of Israel. But now Jesus is the lamb 
the substitute sacrifice one time for all time for all people. Amen? It says, by his blood, the cleansing and the life-giving sacrifice of atonement and reconciliation brought back into right standing with God. By his blood, all right? To be received through faith. You can't get born again without faith. You have to hear the message. That message produces a seed of faith, and then you act on that faith and make Jesus Lord of your life by faith. That doesn't mean you instantly change overnight. Now, you did spiritually, and I've known people that changed outwardly overnight. I mean, they literally became a different person immediately upon that prayer of faith. But then there's others who took time for the minds to be renewed and their emotions to get controlled and their actions to change. Amen? But when we receive by faith what Jesus did, we are a new creation. We're not an old sinner anymore. We are a new creation. That old man died in Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. So it says, this was to show, in other words, God's giving us this freely when we didn't deserve it. In our action of faith, he gave us faith. In fact, he gave us his faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over and ignored former sins without punishment. And that was to demonstrate and prove at this present time in the now season that he himself is righteous and that he justifies and accepts as righteous him who has faith in Jesus. You're not going to heaven without faith. You're not getting saved without faith. And you're not becoming righteous or cleansed from sin without faith. <clears throat> when, again, let me take it back to the word. When you hear the gospel message, that drops a seed of faith into you. That was That's the biggest miracle you'll ever have is getting born again. That seed was enough to change your life forever. If that seed of faith could get you born again and take you from death to life, can't that same seed of faith be applied for your finances? for the healing of your body, for the salvation of your children, your family, for a better job, a raise, a bonus, a new home, uh, whatever, whatever your needs might be, even your desires. That seed of faith is powerful enough to accomplish. If it can accomplish changing you from death to life, it can accomplish anything you need. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, where was I? Um, verse 27. Then what becomes of our pride and our boasting. It is excluded, banished, ruled out entirely. On what principle? On the principle of doing good deeds? In other words, works? No. But on the principle of faith. We're going to have to understand the principle of faith is at work in the Word. And as we go to work in the Word through meditation and study of the Word, then that principle of faith gets in us. And when it gets in us and we feed that principle of faith, it begins to grow and grow. And that little mustard seed faith that you got will take root and grow until it can take over your life, so to speak, and you become a person of faith, walking by faith, declaring by faith, receiving by faith. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, I got about 30 seconds left, I think. Um, oh, gee, I've got about a minute and a half. All right. Let me see if I got one more. All right, verse 28. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> uh, if I get going on this, I, I may go another hour. Uh, I, I heard somebody say, go ahead, Pastor. Uh, I'm not going to do that. I, I hold these Bible studies to an hour. I thought I thought about doing some shorter versions, maybe, maybe a 10-minute segment or a 5-minute segment and take little bits and pieces. But I haven't gotten away from this one-hour time frame, so unless the Lord tells me different, uh, but I might uh, begin to add some other short, you know, quick nuggets that uh, you can hear throughout the week. Anyway, I'm praying about it. Pray for us. We've got some uh, things in front of us that we're looking at plans to reach out and, and change lives uh, where we are in our community, not just through what we're doing in this, but uh, God is showing us some things that will reach and change lives. So be praying for us that we'll get his full wisdom on it, his timing, and that we'll do it in such a way it will bring glory to God. Again, if you're a partner, thank you so much for supporting this ministry. If you're not a partner yet, 
Uh, pray about it, and whatever God tells you to do, just be faithful. Just do that. We're believing God for monthly partners so we can expand what we're doing and reach more people. We love you. Uh, have a blessed week. And I'm going to have to get up and go shut off uh, the camera, at least the, <clears throat> the Facebook feed. So all of you that were with us tonight, have a blessed week. Those of you that are going to watch this later, have a bl be blessed. Receive blessing when you hear this message. In the name of Jesus. I'm tearing off um, Periscope and Twitter right now. They're going off. Done. And Facebook. <laughs>